Good evening, everyone. Uh, we are at 4.30, and I think uh, we should take this opportunity to start off. Thank you, all of you, for actually joining us into this conversation. I think uh, it's been a lot of conversation that has happened over COVID over the past few days. And uh, it's a pleasure to actually have so many people already joined in, and I can see so many people already continuously joining. Uh, before we actually start off, I thought it might be very important for us to just discuss a little on how are we going to run the session. So, so if you could go to the next slide. So very simple, uh, we all understand this. There are simple things around here. Uh, just for convenience, uh, so that the panelists are able to speak through and you're able to write all your comments in the chat. Uh, all microphones uh, of participants are muted in default during the session. Texting will work really well. Send in your text. We already have a lot of questions that we have received, everyone. And you can use the chat to send more questions to us, any queries to us. And we have an interaction at the end, which is planned also using the chat. So we look forward to that. Uh, we are trying to make this as close to a real experience, and hence, uh, to ensure that the attention is actually on the person who is actually speaking, we will uh, advise you to choose the side panel view. Uh, from the default because that will ensure you that you look at uh, the person who is speaking at that point. And on that note, I actually want to start off on my conversation. So welcome to the new normal. So when we actually started having this conversation, a lot of people asked me, uh, why are we actually calling this the new normal? And that was, of course, a couple of weeks back. Now I think there is everyone who is calling it uh, the new normal. In fact, Secure Capital has gone ahead and called this the Black Swan moment. And when we were actually having this interaction, discussion internally, to say, how do we uh, have a conversation around something that has completely changed the way the world looks at itself and the way the world has actually prepared for itself, we said uh, it will be very important to understand how prepared are we in our minds for something as large and as big as this. So I think one of the big things that we wanted to do today was to also set a context around what are we talking about. So when you ask anyone uh, about a pandemic today, everybody stands up and says, uh, yeah, it's, it's a big one. But barely in 2019, not many days back, when a question was asked to some of the biggest leaders worldwide on what are the crisis triggers that they expect to see in the future, and this is a PwC 2019 uh, survey, on crisis preparedness, you can clearly see that something of this magnitude or this kind was not thought of. Typically, our minds are really prepared to think of issues and situations that we are, we are actually grappling with. So we have spoken a lot about VUCA, but if you ask me, this is real VUCA because it is where you are starting to uh, think global, but you'll have to act local, and there are huge challenges that are happening. Typically, if I think of uh, the pandemic of COVID, it's like an elephant that everybody is seeing from different directions, and everybody has their own view and their own perspective about what is this all about. So when we decided to actually bring this conversation on to all of us, we thought we will need multiple perspectives. And that's why we have a very august lineup of panelists that we thought we should actually get in over here. And if you look at the panelists, uh, to begin with, uh, you know, we have Dr. Sanjay Arora. Besides being a doctor as well as a medical practitioner and, the, and someone who runs the organization, I think the credit to uh, Suburban Diagnostics is they are the first private organization in India to get the license uh, to run COVID uh, testing. So we thought it will be very important to get some perspective on how large and how intense is the problem. We, of course, have Praveena. Praveena, as the chief operating officer of NPCI, is actually at the heart of making cashless transaction happen. Now imagine when people cannot step out, how important cashless transaction becomes for the world. Then we have ERA. Uh, we all understood technology is important and technology is extremely important for us to keep working. Guess what? It just trumped us at a completely different level. So ERA, uh, as the head HR from Microsoft, is going to share perspectives on how is technology as a sector looking at this and what is it that they are doing? We also have Chris, Christopher Box. He is our PwC UK partner. And the biggest claim to fame that I would say Chris has is he's leading PwC's global initiatives on COVID for workforce. 
And of course, from an inside out perspective, we have Rana, Dr. Rana, again, being a doctor, but also leading our healthcare practice and advising a lot of people on what are the right things to do. Our very own Padmaja, uh, Padmaja has actually taken some amazing measures as part of the India leadership team and as the chief people officer for India. And of course, there's me, uh, some of you may know me, I am Chaitali. I lead the people and organization consulting. I'll be moderating this session. And most importantly, I'll try and bring back to all of you perspectives on the basis of 50 plus conversations that I've had with leadership teams, organizations on what is this new normal all about. Now we all know technology has the ability to play kaput. So just in case I get disconnected, my fellow partner, Akash, will take over and run the session. So now coming to the real conversation. So I thought the first thing that you would want to do is understand the COVID-19 environment because workforce and organizations operate in the context of that. So my first question is to you, Sanjay. If you could, uh, you know, definitely get your screen up. Sanjay, how intense do you think is uh, this entire uh, problem? And uh, according to you, over the next three to six months time frame, how much and what all should corporations be doing? What's your advice on that? Well, Chetali, thank you for inviting me and uh, thank you for allowing me to share my experience. Um, you know, I have, I'm a, a little intimidated with the kind of people that I'm, you know, uh, speaking to or speaking with, um, you know, uh, but I'll try and share my you know, first-hand experience of what it has been for us over the last maybe 15 days. Um, my first feedback is that, you know, the world is what I call in a reset mode. Uh, actually, the world, the, you know, somebody has pressed the reset button and that's what is happening to us. And uh, whether we like to believe it or not, uh, the virus is here to stay. Uh, it's not something that's going to just, you know, go away because we want it to or we wish it to. That's not going to happen. I'll share our experience. So we began testing on 24th of March, and it's been 10 days. Uh, we have uh, tested about uh, 1,700 samples in these days. Um, what I can share is that initially the positivity rate was uh, extremely high and you know unnerving. But as days have gone by, I'm I'm finding that the positivity rate actually has come down. So which is a good sign for all of us that uh, you know this whole issue with lockdown and you know the info it's a tough decision but i think it's a very good decision and i can see that in the results that we are churning out every day but it's still very early days for us just to put this in perspective um, today india stands at about you know around 30 tests done per million population and if we were to look at some of the global statistics uh, and south korea seems to be a you know a sort of a benchmark uh, for, uh, you know, how they have handled this crisis. Uh, South Korea, you know, has done close to 7,500 tests per million population. You can just see the gap where we are at 30 per million and South Korea at 7,500 per million. Um, US was something like, you know, very slow starter. And you can see the impact that it has had uh, on the healthcare system in the US. Uh, so that's where it is that the virus is a highly infectious fellow. Uh, it's, uh, you know, spreads really fast, spreads very easily. 80% of the population is going to be asymptomatic. So we don't really know who's a carrier. So lockdown is essential. Uh, you know, and I believe that, uh, you know, social distancing will be the norm. As you ask the new normal, um, at least for the next few months, uh, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, social distancing will be part of that norm. My concern is, uh, you know, not what will happen in the next 15 days, but what will happen after those 15 days. Um, and I'd like to summarize it in, you know, two alphabets. Are we going to go into a W phase or are we going to go into a U phase? When I say a W phase is that, you know, uh, when the lockdown things go down, then the lockdown is released and we go back up. When we go back up, again, there's a problem. And again, we go into a lockdown. That's not what we want to do. We don't want to go into a W phase. What I would rather suggest is let's go into a U phase and have a staggered getting back to life. You know, if things are opened up, if the floodgates open on uh, 15th or 16th of April, 
uh, I believe it will be catastrophic for us. Uh, we are not we are not ready for that. I think data over the next 10 days from all the labs that have been given the permission to do testing, the government authorities need to collate. At this point of time, I see a little bit of a disconnect between ICMR and the state governments. They're not sort of talking to each other as, as fast or as much as they should. Uh, if we can get that on real time, I think they'll be able to churn out data and be able to predict, you know, uh, take more informed decisions. Uh, what I believe is that, uh, you know, the game changer here is going to be the vaccine. Um, you know, the vaccine is going to be the real uh, impact in this whole process. And uh, that is at least 12 months, if not more away. So I would not urge people to think only for the next 15 days. I would urge people to think for the next 15 months. That is sort of the way I would look at it, that those who can, you know, should continue to work from home. You know, you have to limit social experiences. Uh, you know, God forbid if it enters the slums or the rural areas, uh, it'll be a very different uh, ball game for us. So I, I think we are in for a, a completely, you know, altered social experience uh, over the next, I would say, at least 12 to 15 months. All right, Sanjay. I think uh, spooky as it sounded, but it is definitely real since it's coming from the doctors who are at the heart of it. I think for me, the two key takeaways that I heard from you, Sanjay, was number one, uh, W or U. And the, the transition from the W or U will actually decide what happens to corporations and economies. And the second one that I heard from you, it's not a 15-day affair. It's a 12-month to a 15-month affair. Absolutely. And how do we actually uh, prepare for it? Super, yes. super, Sanjay. So now let me go to Rana. Hi, Rana. So you heard what Sanjay has said. And I remember in our partners call, you didn't say anything very different. How do you see the whole uh, healthcare as an industry reacting and preparedness for this kind of a situation in India as well as internationally? Because you are working with both of them. Yeah. Thank you, Chaitali. I think, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Sanjay put it very aptly. I think, uh, you know, some of the traditional building blocks about how do we think of healthcare have actually been broken. So, you know, when we all went to medical school, you were taught, you know, you had acute disease, that's malaria, or you had chronic disease, uh, but that was it. So I think now we're talking about a triple burden of disease. Pandemics have come, they've come here to stay for a time. It's only a question of when the next happens. So I think it fundamentally alters the way you look at a healthcare system because uh, in many ways, you know, we were not even prepared to handle chronic disease. What we really did was we handled acute episodic care very well. You have a problem, you go to hospital, you get treated. But when you need to go episodically to the hospital, we weren't doing very well. And that's why, you know, we're still the diabetic capital of the world. And suddenly, you know, we have a third. So I think it's going to fundamentally change the triple burden of disease, and we'll have to relook at it. Uh, the second part, I think it's broken a lot of myths. Uh, there was a lot of myth that, you know, you physically need to go to a doctor because, you know, you can't convey or you can't communicate. Uh, because we as our physicians, you know, have judgment, creativity, empathy, those components are very important. But this is, a disease where I think the caregiver is equally impacted. So by just meeting the doctor, you know, you're not only putting yourself at risk, but you're putting the physician at risk. And close to, you could see 15% of the people who have actually died have been either medical practitioners or those connected with the healthcare industry. So I think the new normal is also going to be talking that, uh, you know, during the pandemic, you know, I spoke to a doctor, I sent him an email, I did a video consultation. The pandemic's over, but I don't go back. I think the analogy is very strong to, you know, we don't go to a bank anymore. We do it online or we go to an ATM. But, uh, you know, our parents still want to traditionally go to the bank because they see there's a personal touch. I think that's going to change. Also, what's going to change from that perspective is does primary care actually require you to be, or is your data good enough? You know, so I think this is where technology will come in. Uh, I think the force of processing big data algorithms 
uh, will probably, at least in the primary care space, you know, obviate the need for us to go to hospitals for quite some time. Uh, the third thing I think is, uh, you know, it always isn't glamorous, but, uh, you know, when the challenge comes in, it's about the public health care infrastructure. And for years, you know, we spend about 1% of our GDP on public health. You know, and 70% of the delivery actually happens in the private sector. So when a public health emergency comes in, you know, then it, you know, the neglect for years comes out. Uh, because public health is not so glamorous, it doesn't get you votes, it's always been neglected. So I think when we look back at this, I think the new normal is how do you access healthcare? One is that you have a geographical access. It breaks the mold. Do I need to go to a doctor? So unless I'm really sick or I need a surgery. The second is the financial access. And I think the government is increasingly through Ayushman given a financial access to be able. But I third, I think what's going to come out is basically we need a technological access, which is 24 by seven. We neither have the doctors, nor the hospitals, nor the beds, nor the ventilators. So I think uh, while there's a lot of gloom and doom, I think it's a good time to set those building blocks where we get a healthcare infrastructure. So when the next pandemic happens, you know, there is not so much of panic. Chetan. Super, super, Dr. Rana. So we understand now a little bit, hopefully, uh, what the pandemic is. We also know our preparedness or rather the lack of it from you, Dr. Rana. Uh, let's come to you, Praveena. I think the most interesting and most important question for all of us is, how do you see this impacting the economy of the country? And uh, sitting right in the middle of the BFSI sector, uh, sitting right in the center of uh, uh, the whole digital payments, how are you seeing all of this impacting all of us, Pravina? Pravina, are you there? Hey, Chetan. Yeah, here I am. Perfect. So the, the impact on the economy is, um, is, you know, cannot be underestimated for sure. Um, you know, there is, uh, people are not having social interactions. Uh, there is no discretionary spend, no discretionary purchase. And when I say discretionary, it's easy to call it discretionary, but we're talking about just buying clothes, just buy, you know, going, going to a restaurant, just like day-to-day -day stuff, right? Um, and without that, there are going to be a number of industries that are impacted. Um, and I'll sort of focus here a little bit on the BFSI as well as the, the payments industry. So if you look at the BFSI sector, you know, and starting with banks, um, you know, there are uh, consumers with, uh, you know, credit cards, with, uh, you know, personal loans, there could be a mortgage running. So there are a number of both secured assets as well as unsecured assets you know, uh, like a personal loan uh, that a bank deploys today. And it's quite possible that, you know, there could be a, a fair amount of, uh, you know, non-performing assets there, you know, primarily because a certain section of the population that doesn't have an earning, uh, you know, right now, who, who are not necessarily in the, uh, in the space where they still continue to earn a salary, you know, are unable to, to make certain payments, you know, that they had planned for. So there is going to be some stress in that space. In fact, RBI has been proactive in giving a three month uh, moratorium. Um, you know, that, uh, the banks are still sort of working out how that will actually get executed. And I think that's going to be of some help for sure. Um, but the implication of, of all of this is something that we have to wait and see. If you look at the other side of the banking sector on the corporate side, you know, organizations uh, that have a strong underlying um, you know, uh, transactional structure who have, you know, good, uh, you know, cash flows, who, who have cash and who are less leveraged uh, will have the ability to come out of this more unscathed than others. Uh, there could be sectors which are more leveraged, um, you know, where there will be challenges in the way they will be able to step up and get up on their feet. So I'm sure that there will be a number of policy actions that will take place, uh, both from the government side as well as the regulator. To, to really help the, the, the industry get back on its feet after this point. Um, the, the RBI has also sort of, you know, uh, come up with a repo rate revision, you know, creating more liquidity in the market. 
uh, but it doesn't mean that everyone's just going to go out there and you know give out uh, uh, lending money uh, because uh, risk is going to be a very important factor and uh, will be looked at a, a lot more stringently than perhaps it was even earlier but all of this also creates certain opportunities and uh, those opportunities are in terms of this whole digital space um, you know if you look at the policy approach towards uh, digital onboarding you know digital uh, kyc uh, you know digital transactions um, you know digital uh, supply chain uh, digital fulfillment i think a number of those are now being redesigned uh, you know, there was always a positive inclination, and I think many organizations were doing better than others. Um, but while from a policy standpoint, you know, the country really wanted to go in that direction, we have not really ironed out all the rough edges and, you know, really made all of uh, the digital experience friction-free. And now is the time when, right from, you know, regulators, policymakers, you know, corporates, uh, you know, whether it's retail or online. So everyone is looking back and saying, how can I how can I still cater to this uh, my business? How do I still keep running, um, you know, and and get digital over this? So I think we are going to come out of this uh, looking at uh, new models, looking at um, you know less friction in terms of really what go digital is all about. So that's something that's going to throw up opportunities, and I think we are already seeing. Um, you know, you see that we are all at home and, you know, suddenly there are a, a number of wellness apps and, you know, there's a lot of online yoga and online, uh, you know, dance schools, um, you know, online education. It, it, it was always there, but it's, it's just sort of suddenly become uh, so much more prevalent. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, what's happened with Zoom and, you know, video conferencing, you know, we are here on, you know, Cisco WebEx, which is a more sort of a corporate tool. Uh, but I think the number of people who have suddenly learned how to do, you know, video conferences, it, it's just amazing. Uh, it's no longer a, a, a millennial or a, a digitally native sort of segments uh, skill. It's become a skill, a skill for, uh, you know, mature professionals and, uh, you know, the older people as well. So a, a number of behavioral changes are getting uh, created. You know, organizations are, as we speak, also reinventing themselves, uh, the smaller, nimbler, agile organizations, I think, will do you know even better in that space. Um, and while all of this is happening, uh, you know, there is also we find uh, you know private equity investments. Um, so private equity investments are uh, ongoing. Um, that's you know quite heartening to note. Uh, one would have thought that you know suddenly things will freeze and everyone will wait for everything to get back to normal, but that's not the case. Uh, private equity investment, we're still seeing some some level of, uh, you know, Series B funding, Series A funding, you know, some of the fintechs are still getting, you know, funded. Uh, so there's, there's sort of heartening news there and potentially some of the organizations get this right. And of course, the world survives all this stuff, uh, the healthcare industry and, uh, you know, uh, everyone gets us uh, into a good shape. Then, you know, we could we could see some very evolved models at the end of all of this. Now, digital payments, and you know that's really where NPCI operates, and uh, it's been uh, the, the the full focus for us has been on uh, getting the attention on people to use digital payments as a safe mechanism of payment. Um, so this is uh, you know to create an awareness around this. Uh, there might be people who are already users who might be using it, uh, you know, on a, uh, not always uh, you know using the digital payment. Uh, there could be a number of people who are still not on the platform and i think all of this is something that can come together you know platforms like upi that are completely uh, mobile uh, focused can be used for you know money transfers whether it is you know end of the month and you just want to like pay up your driver no matter you know where your driver is or the organizations who want to pay up their staff we are not talking about the the, the, the very high values right so you know this is like your 10000 50000 1 lakh 2 lakh kind of payments um, as well as merchant payments, you know, merchants trying to, uh, you know, get onboarded on a platform like UPI so that people are able to, uh, you know, give a call or send a WhatsApp message, uh, you know, then uh, go on a platform, make a digital payment, and, you know, you, then you have a, a less touch delivery uh, of groceries and uh, sort of various uh, critical items happening. So all of this is also something that we are seeing in the, in the digital payment space. Um, so I think you know it's early days, uh, as we've heard in the in the conversation so far, and we'll have to watch all of this very closely. 
Super, Praveena, super. So we know the pandemic, we know the preparedness of the healthcare industry, and uh, we heard about the economy and obvious known uh, impacts, right? But we heard some interesting things in Praveena, uh, what you said, which was the use of technology. So really, at, from my side, uh, we are four of us at home working using technology. My husband is a banker, so he has to go to the bank. But my two daughters, age 10 and 6, and I are actually working on the same technology. So technology has actually changed the way we are going to look at the world and the way we are going to connect. We were pushed to it never as much as we have been pushed now. And I think uh, this is the right time, Ira, to get you on board. As the head HR of Microsoft, how are you viewing technology as an industry, shaping, taking away things from the industry, and what will it do to the world? Um, good. Good evening to everybody on the call. I think um, it's wonderful actually to listen to everybody who's spoken thus far. Uh, I think one of the things that certainly we are seeing is that the impact of um, technology on our lives beyond uh, work alone has really, I think, been transformational just in this short period of time. Um, at Microsoft, certainly, we have a number of uh, platforms and solutions for companies, uh, for consumers, for organizations that are seeing, um, I think, completely unprecedented growth. Uh, so for example, uh, you know, uh, we have something called Microsoft Teams, which is our own uh, communication and collaboration platform. And um, what it has done is because it makes working virtually so easy, it has seen just, and I'll give you an example, just in Italy, 775% rise in users um, since COVID. Um, uh, you know, we've seen over, I think it's about 900, 950 million meeting and calling minutes a day. We see close to 44, 45 million daily users in a single week. And these are not our traditional users. These are all kinds of users. Uh, these are uh, experiences that now healthcare professionals, government officials, frontline workers, um, residential societies, uh, crisis management teams, um, students, teachers are using for uh, just going about their daily work. And so I think what we are seeing, Skype, many of you might be more familiar with Skype. What we are seeing with Skype, which is our audio and video calling service, is there is a 70% increase every month. Now, these are large numbers because, as you can imagine, the base was already incredibly large. And so calling minutes, for example, are up close to 250%. So there is a dramatic impact that we are already seeing in the uh, intersectionality of life and technology. But I also believe that uh, the scale, the pace, and the depth of change is something that perhaps we are all trying still to wrap our heads around uh, as a world. Uh, I don't think such a, uh, in, such a large uh, impact has been felt, at least in this generation, uh, to this extent of pervasiveness. And I think we are still going to have to um, figure it out and feel our way around in the best way possible as it, as it emerges. Um, and so uh, I think Praveena spoke about digital uh, transformation, and we have, I do believe that there's going to be incredible amounts of digital transformation. I also think that there are some very specific places where we are already seeing a significant shift. One of those, for example, is telemedicine. There's a lot of conversation today about, you know, can doctors be available virtually for patient diagnosis? Uh, what are the ethics of doctors diagnosing and then prescribing prescription medication in a virtual construct? Those are things now that we are having to discuss. Remote working, of course, everybody knows, uh, but the extent of remote working and the nature of workers who are now working remotely and therefore using virtual platforms is significantly different also from what we would have imagined a couple of months ago. Um, the other conversation that we are hearing increasingly is that organizations are going to be assessing in a new fashion fixed versus variable costs. 
So how much does an organization really want to invest, for example, in office infrastructure, in real estate? Uh, if virtualization workplaces yields a certain degree of efficiency, then do you really want to have many offices and many desks? So whether that results in hot desking or whether that results in a different socioeconomic dynamic in terms of working from home, and therefore a new definition of how people will be able to balance work and personal life, that is a continuum that we're going to have to see as, a, as, as humanity as it unfolds. Uh, the other is online learning and the opportunities around online learning are almost now age no bar. Earlier there was online training for corporates, which was very prominent. Uh, college students would do online stuff. Uh, but now whether it's kindergarten children or uh, you know generations of those children's grandparents, um, online learning I think is going to become and is already becoming a ton more pervasive. And I think the other one, which again Praveena uh, touched upon is almost the concept of contactless commerce. You know, uh, how do I do business without really coming into contact with either the recipient or the payee or any of that? And I think therefore the ability uh, to flex uh, our operations in whichever business we are in uh, without losing efficiency uh, the ability to bring in apps to improve uh, consumer experiences or customer experiences, and our ability to adopt technology based on our very quick learning of how to be more efficient when labor is unavailable in traditional yeah. forms. I think all of this is going to define uh, this new normal uh, that you spoke about, Chaitanya. Super, Ira. I think. Um it is can't get better in terms of setting the context of what this new normal is. And the whole contactless uh, consumption is something that will have to get a very different shape. While at one side, we are the social animals that we are, uh, but the reality is uh, this is a different world that we are all setting ourselves into. And on this note, uh, you know, Padmija, I'd like to call upon you now. Uh, of course, you've been having multiple conversations with uh, people in the HR fraternity with CEOs, CXOs, board members, as they are seeking advice from us, as they are trying to understand what is it that even say a PwC is doing? How are you viewing Indian organizations managing this from the people perspective? Thanks, Chetali. Uh, good evening to everyone. Hope you're all well and safe, doing as well as can be in the new norm. So I think there's been so much of rich insight from the panelists, really, really good thought-provoking views. Maybe I will just add, uh, Chaitali, three of the things that stand out, maybe less about what we've done, which I'll come to see a little later, but more about if I look back at the last two or three weeks, what are some of the things that really stand out in terms of reflections? Right? I think the first is uh, our country and many of our organizations, for example, in PwC, 80% of our is actually millennials. So as everyone has said, this is like a reset button. It's really a crisis which we're all trying to get our heads around. Having said that, millennials is probably the first time that they are experiencing crisis, right? Maybe those who have been in the workplace longer, nothing of magnitude, which is true. But, you know, we still have memories of the global financial crisis, maybe the 2000s. And while those were largely financial and didn't impact other aspects, and this is different, there's still some experience of, you know, crisis, difficult situations, which help to build some resilience. So I think many of our work, it is probably the first time that experiencing crisis, and I think that's where so many of us really need to step up, help them deal with it. But I also feel that, you know, we tend to look at generations as products of the environment they grew up, right? So, and millennials. And I think in many ways, this is really shaping how a generation is building its own resilience and really get shaping its own character. So that's one reflection when I, you know, uh, maybe the second one is really about how, as organizations, the notion of redundancy has got. So in normal times, what we consider redundancy, in times like this, becomes very important. 
keep make sure the lights don't go off. So whether it's in terms of functions uh, which come up to the front, skills that become more important than ever now, I think there's a lot of appreciation and reset even in functional priorities and organizational priorities. So something which is redundancy in normal times now takes absolute and I think the whole reprioritization of skills and capabilities that will also happen to continue as we keep ahead. Because we heard uh, Anna and Dr. Sanjay talk about how maybe pandemics will be the new normal. So as we adjust in our definition of how we look at different functions and priorities, I think we we'll start to challenge and reflection. The third reflection is that Parnaja, if you could just uh, uh, come closer to the microphone, I think the voice might get a little better. Thank you. Sure, sure. Would you like me to go through any of the points earlier? Was the audio very bad? No, no, I think this is fine. I think if you could just repeat the earlier point, that would be great. Sure. So I was just having two observations, Chaitali. I uh, thought I would just look back more in terms of reflections to your question. The first was really that I felt in many ways this is actually um, Defining the generation of millennials, right? And in fact, of a crisis and how resilience building, we tend to look at generations as the product of what they went through, Gen X or Y or Z millennials. And in many ways, this is actually shaping, I think, the character of the generation. Secondly, I was making the comment that, you know, in organizations, at times like this, what may appear to be redundancy is value. How do you make sure that you keep the lights going? Yeah. So I think as the reset button is set, uh, as pressed, the notion of function that become critical and the reprioritization is another aspect that really comes out, right? That's what I'm hearing across so many companies. The third reflection I wanted to share was, uh, you know, just the whole notion of leadership right? in all time. And it strikes me that just the notion of leadership and the balance between head, heart and gut is even more true in this time, right? So the head for scenario planning, looking ahead, I mean, it's completely new, we can predict, but how do you do the whole sense making, what's happening, what are the different alternatives and how do we act? So the head coming in very strong, the heart coming in very strong, because the whole notion of empathy, how do you put your arms around everyone as much as you possibly can virtually? Empathy, connect, uh, becomes really important. So that's the heart. And finally, the whole piece on guts, which is courage, right? Being able to role model that, you know what, we haven't dealt with this before, but we deal with it together and we have the courage. So I think for leaders, the whole conflict between head, heart, and gut, even more important at this time. Maybe I'll just share the last learning briefly and then hand it back to you, Chetali, which is, I think the learning from a lot of organizations also has been just about the need for agility in response, right? So it's not about waiting for the perfect answer. There's nothing like uh, the perfect answer, but as we deal with this, it's really about, you know, finding, trying to find what appears to be a good solution, acting on it, learning from it, and then quickly moving on. So not about waiting for perfection, because this is something that we are co-creating as we go along, but really moving ahead quickly with agility and willingness to keep correcting us. So those are four reflections that came to me as I kind of think of organizations, so many organizations, and our own these last few weeks that I thought I'd share. So back to you. Thank you so much, Padmaja. I think this was very, very insightful. Uh, being uh, vulnerable as a leader never goes out of fashion, actually. And such moments actually test that to the hilt, our ability to just be vulnerable, be able to stand up and say, uh, I don't know and we will figure out as we keep moving on, is I think what we heard. And if I just kind of uh, uh, try and connect the dots between what Sanjay said of the UNW and the 15 months, and Dr. Rana spoke about the industry. Ravina spoke about the contactless consumer that will come up. And Ira, the way you spoke about how technology will take a space that we also cannot imagine right now. And Padmaja, the way you said, leadership will have to work in a very, very different way. I love what you said about preserving. And on that note, uh, I'd like to call on Chris. Hi, Chris, are you around? Thank you. Lovely, lovely. Chris. 
So, uh, Chris, uh, I think we've had some very interesting conversations so far, but uh, there are a few things it is uh, uh, good to be ahead and not too good to be ahead, but let's for a chance say that it's good to be have been hit by COVID before us. So you all have had a three weeks, uh, you know, opportunity to look at it more closely. So tell me, how is it uh, that you all are looking at this entire pandemic and its impact on economy? Most importantly, how are you viewing it in India or for India? Because I know there is a lot of correlation between the sector that you handle uh, otherwise and its impact on India, which is BFSI with so many shared services in India. So what's your view, Chris? Well, th thank you for the, for the question and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Just uh, before I start, I'd just uh, like to say I hope you're all safe and well during this uh, really challenging time. So uh, specifically to the question, and maybe I'll answer it in two bits and just give you a bit of a view on what's happening from a European perspective and then sort of link it to to, to India and how European entities in particular are sort of addressing uh, the, the links to India. So if I can, I think um, what we found naturally in, in a situation like this is that there's lots of firefighting initially. Um, the way that's manifested with, uh, with organisations across Europe has been... Uh, lots of effort to really interpret what the, what's coming out from government. So different uh, different governments across Europe and indeed in the US, I was on a call, which is why I was a bit late to this one, uh, preparing for a session in the US later on today. And what we found in that initial sort of first week or so, it was very much around firefighting. So interpreting messages around things like staying from home and then practical advice to employees around how they can work effectively, making sure that technology is set up effectively so people can engage with each other and continue to work in many instances. So that first sort of phase is firefighting. And I would say in the main, we're now at the end of that in Europe. Um, we're moving into a second phase, which is about stabilization, which is slightly more considered um, and thinking through the, the implications. So thinking about cost management, um, not just from a headcount and people perspective, but everything linked to the processes in organisations. Um, there's a real focus on wellbeing, um, recognising that people could be working at home for a significant period of time. How do people keep that connectivity together so they can continue to work, but also cognizant of the fact that the working day, because people are based at home in many, many cases, is becoming very blurred. Um, and also there's pressures around childcare. There's a risk that my kids come in at some point, so apologies if they do. Um, uh, the, 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 the care that's required of, of elderly relations as well. So I think there's in that stabilization phase, um, sort of consideration that there could be a new normal that we're gonna experience. And a very practical point there around working through existing policies and procedures to still, still make sure that they're fit for purpose. By way of an example, there's been a lot of attention this week on still encouraging people to take their holiday uh, entitlement um, and, and to not just store it up for a, for a time when, when um, we, we think that there's going to be sort of a release from the, uh, the work at home situation. I just turned on my camera as well, so apologies if that wasn't on. I thought it was on for the first couple of minutes. I don't think it really enhances the conversation by seeing me, but I'll leave you to make that judgment. Then there's a third bit to this. Um, which is the bit where I get really energized. And I think there's a, because we will turn the corner on this. Lots of organizations across Europe are starting to get to this very early stages, but how do you make sure that you're not releasing too many employees? So when we do see an economic upturn, and the most obvious ones are in the, the retail sector, the hospitality sector, how do you make sure you, you can bring capability back into the organization at pace? so that you can really ride the wave of an economic upturn. So organizations, very early stages, and I think next week and the week after, we'll see lots more evidence of it. Organizations starting to think about the slightly longer term impact, not just from an economic perspective, but from two other perspectives as well. One is there's been, been good things that have occurred through this crisis, and that may sound like a funny thing to say, and it may be slightly premature to say to, a, to an Indian audience at the moment, but there are good things. So the, the you know, things that we've been trying to do around flexible working for a long time, we've all embraced it. I, I don't know how you're all finding it in your organisation, but 
people are turning on their cameras much more than they ever used to. They're trying to engage in a much more natural and authentic way. And uh, I think we need to make sure as employers with making sure that when we do move to a normal, even if it's a new normal, that those good behaviors that we've seen through this crisis are then embedded as we go forward. The, the second bit um, that organizations are I think it's sort of started to be talked about this week in particular is around purpose and understanding what organizations stand for, what employees want <coughs> from their employers, and how people are behaving now, how organizations are behaving now, could have a lasting impact on their reputation in the marketplace. We saw a major employer um, in the hospitality sector in the UK who sent letters to all of their employees basically telling them that they lost their jobs and they had to move out of the service accommodation that they were living in within 24 hours. That has had, I think, a terminal brand damage on that particular employer. Um, so I think thinking through the decisions that you're making now and the impact in the longer term post-COVID is absolutely critical. The last point I'll make, and then I'll pause for a second if I can, um, is that in terms of how you're addressing this, um, is probably really important. If I could give you one learning on that, I think in the early stages across Europe, everyone was firefighting. And then what we're seeing now is a separation of those um, responsibilities. There's still an element of firefighting dealing with day-to-day -day queries around sickness and wellness and those sorts of things. That's typically being dealt with by a different team. What we're seeing organizations do is segment that firefighting capability and then having a separate team who are looking at sort of longer and more broader strategy and the implications of COVID over the longer term. And they're using scenario plans will link into the expected length of lockdown to really model that. I'll pause and then let me, if it's useful, to talk about India. But let me just pause there for a second and sort of I could talk about the impact of um, major UK employers and how they're linking to particular service capability in India. Would you like me to go on to talk about that? Yeah, I think, Chris, it would be wonderful because I think uh, one very important insight, uh, which is a very important one that we'll also hear today through, is uh, treating the, the moment today and the moment that's going to come separately and work on it in parallel. Uh, very, very eager uh, as the Indian audience to hear what are you thinking about, uh, what's your view on uh, the, the India? Yeah, so, so, let, so let, me, let me talk about it if I can, through uh, primarily through a financial services lens, because that's the sector yeah. that, I, that I lead. Um, obviously, uh, many financial services uh, organizations have significant capability and talent in, in India. And I think um, what everyone's recognizing, and I would say this has occurred over the last week, is the reliance on single geography um, shared service capability is a major risk to organizations and their ability to be able to service their operations globally on an ongoing basis as a result of COVID-19. Now, I don't think this is limited to COVID-19. And I think what we will see um, increasingly within that strategy box that I talked about earlier on um, is a fundamental review of that whole supply chain and consideration of concentration risk from a geographical perspective. I think that creates risk for India. I think it also can create opportunity as well. Um, and I think that the risk is obviously, if, if, there's, uh, if you're an employer with major concentration in India, the obvious thing you're gonna think about is geographical diversification, um, which could be part of the solution. However, I think the opportunity element comes from the, the, the opportunity here to really educate those global employers around the quality of the talent that does sit in India and not see it just as a lower cost solution, but one that is absolutely fundamental in delivering supply chain. So I do think if we can catch this wave in the right way from an India perspective, it's an opportunity to educate the sort of global economy around the quality of the talent that and that sits in, in your geographical market. So there is a sort of a, you know, risk and opportunity, I think, sitting alongside each other. Everyone, uh, and as I say, you know, I've been dealing with the US quite a lot as well. The US and Europe are absolutely waking up to, uh, up to this. I think they're perceiving it primarily as a risk at the moment. So I think we need to try and, from an India perspective, try and get that balance back and help people to think about this as an opportunity to reevaluate the, the way in which you know, such 
quality talent is utilized as part of global operations. Super, super, Chris. I think this was extremely useful. So if I were to look at what I heard right now, I heard some four or five very important pieces. I heard about not viewing it from a 15 days, 15 weeks, but a 50, 12 to 15 months perspective. I heard about uh, contactless consumers actually coming up big time. I, I also heard uh, something very, very important that you said, that single locations might actually become challenging, but there is an opportunity hidden in it. And how do we actually look for those opportunities? And I think the most important one that I heard was, of course, the entire conversation around parallel teams to operate on the business as usual today and the new business as usual that we are aspiring for. So, well, uh, you know, when we uh, actually thought about putting this whole context in place, we wanted to get multiple perspectives, and thank you all my panelists for putting it so beautifully, but we all know human beings love data, more so when they are Indians. <laughs> so, uh, we also tried to actually look at some data. So, PwC has been running uh, a COVID-19 uh, survey, which is a survey that's being run uh, principally with CXOs. It's a multi-territory uh, CXO survey. And the intent of the survey is very simple. It's a pulse check. It's a pulse check to understand how are we looking at the problem. So what we did was we actually uh, picked up two important questions from that. And so if you can go to the next uh, slide, uh, I think the important one that we wanted to do as part of key insights was the first one. We asked, uh, and we are continuously asking, so the interesting thing about the survey is it's, it's a live one and it's changing every week to see how intense is the difference of being observed by leadership CXOs across the world. So the first question that we picked up is what are your top three concerns with respect to COVID-19? I think no prizes for guessing. The first one ought to be uh, the potential global recession that the people are viewing. But the way I would actually look at this entire slide is slightly different. While there is a conversation on global recession, I think the big ones that are standing underneath it are, uh, you know, supply chain issues, effects of workforce or reduction in productivity. Now, whenever a global recession has come, it's about cutting down, pulling down things. Who talks about supply chain issues? So there is an intrinsic paradox that is sitting inside this, which is we are being pushed by an energy that will not enable us to do what we are used to do, doing because basic amenities are not going anywhere, the demand for that. But our ability to make that happen is going to become that much more difficult. Simply put, it's seeking a very different thinking. And then we picked up the next question, which was around people. What, which of the following does your company expect to occur in the next month? And I think productivity loss is well understood. All organizations were talking about that, a change in staff, et cetera. But if I actually stay a bit on this slide, it is telling me two things. In times like this, we have to do more with the people that we have in hand. But guess what? Those people with whom we need to do more, what if they choose life over livelihood? How do we get more output? Because there is a huge anxiety, there is a huge pressure of fear, of morale that's also getting impacted. So on that note, I think it would be very useful for us to hear from our panelists on how are organizations handling it? And on this one, I want to break this whole conversation into two parts. I'll first come to uh, our internal uh, for the inside out view. So Chris, I'll first come to you to very quickly hear from you. Uh, I think you did cover some of them, but specifically into PwC UK, what is it, or PwC Europe, if there are top two or three practices that you feel are standing out that organizations need to consider? So, so I'll pick two and try and keep it really simple. I think the first point is around tone and getting the, the tone right. Um, so PwC UK um, has been absolutely focused on trying to create reassurance for our employees. You know, we, don't, we do come from a position where we have a strong balance sheet, so we're able to make certain commitments. But I, I think what's absolutely critical is um, if you're able to, um, is, is to try and, try and create reassurance for your, your employees where that's appropriate, right? And if that's not appropriate for whatever reason, then I think e equally, this is, if there's ever a time for simplicity of message, if there's ever time for authentic messages from leaders 
I think this is it. And I, I look at how that's being received, certainly by our workforce in the UK, it's been well received, right? Because they're, they're seeing video casts um, from people in their home locations and that's creating a, a better sense of authenticity. I think the other thing, and we're sort of moving into this second phase, because um, I think the first bit with the tone was very much around caring for people above and beyond anything, and that remains consistent. But the second tone that we're starting to sort of merge into it now is, We've only got the ability to do that if we've still got a business. So we do need to stay focused. So the second point um, is around focus. So care and focus, I think, are the two words that I'd probably leave you with. Super, Chris. Uh, and, and absolutely, it's important for the going concern to remain going, for us to be able to take people going on along with us. And I think that's a very, very important perspective uh, that we'll have to have uh, conversations with our teams on. Admira, uh, I'm coming to you on this one, and, and I think this is very, very important. How are you seeing PwC uh, doing, managing some of these people practices? What are some of the most important thoughts that are in, on your mind? Number one, and number two, uh, people are talking two or three things in parallel, right? They're talking about employee morale, they are talking about operating models, and they are talking about virtuality. How does one choose or balance between them? Sure. Uh, thanks, Shetali. So if I look back on this whole piece on practices, some of the things we're doing, I think to me, largely it falls into two buckets, if I may. One is really about uh, practices for managing for the present. It's very important. But I also feel it is equally important in terms of looking ahead, uh, really planning, thinking ahead, because we have to be positive in these times and it's important in terms of to also be So when I start with the first uh, set, which is really about practices that we are very hard on for our people in this time, I think three things stand out. First is just the reset on policy, right? I mean, if you look at very, very practical situations, for example, we have more than uh, 200 employees who outside the country, with the short-term project, you know, three months, six months economies. So how do you make sure you bring everyone back safe? Right? Existing policies just don't work in that situation. You just have to what is the right thing by your people at that point of time. How do you make sure that uh, in just a few days, 50,000 people are absolutely up and ready to work? I think firms like us have had flexibility work from home for a long time. Just to test that 15,000 people, just how do you make sure that everyone's equipped? Uh, what do they need in terms of support, bandwidth, headset, so many other things? A lot of operational and transactional issues, but policies need to be completely reset to help stand up 15,000 people to be able to do this. Right? Even something as simple as working hours, I think we hear from so many staff that very interestingly, staff sometimes say they miss commute. Uh, a commute, which we always complained about, in a way, it's almost like a boundary that you set between your working day and you kind of get into a different zone, the transition. Maybe you pick up work later in the day, but in a way, it's kind of a boundary that you go through and you kind of, if not switch off, please reset. But at here, you don't really have that, right? So even in terms of working hours, how do you make sure that you equip people to have time to spend on shows, spend time with young children? They physically see you at home and they're upset because you know, you're not engaging with them like they think you should. So how do you do that? Uh, help desk, just to help employees figure out on answers to so many questions. It could be medical. We're fortunate we have doctors like Dr. Lana and his team, part of our team, and can really step in and answer questions, but how to also give access to the counseling helplines, helplines to deal with stress. So there's so many ways to help in terms of addressing our people's needs at this point of time. And I think we really needed to hit reset on so many of them and so really quickly. Um, the other part also in terms of managing the present has the present has really been on communication and you know well being, right? So at this point of time we've also learned that it's really important to help our all our teams focus on well being, physical, uh, the mental, emotional, just to help them cope with stress. We've, you know, look at programs around that. We launched something called 
V for wellness, W E V for wellness, which looks at you know how do you um, set aside help most of our employees come together at certain points in a day to participate jointly on you know some of these things, yoga, meditation, fitness sessions. So we've tried to enable that. Uh, we've also tried to use again technology in a big way. Uh, Kira spoke so much about how the adoption has gone up, but see how do you have these community groups? Okay? So teams just having coffee together, or if it's weekend, we have so much of music, jugal bandi. So we've tried to drive and facilitate a lot of that community feeling. Someone called it, they said social distancing, sure, but let's at least have distant socializing. I think we're seeing that distant socializing has really picked up. Communicating the whole cascade, so the chairman speaking with our employees, and then following it up with a lot of team communications, just so that messages is clear, consistent, reassurance is there. But I think we've really tried to make sure that we put our arms around everyone at the time. So that is a lot of things that we are trying to do in terms of managing the current uh, situation and helping all our teams put the business together. But I think the other piece, which is equally important, is really about looking ahead. So I think in terms of Trading models, for example, we are finding that, again, we need agility. So some of our areas of work, we are seeing a spike in requirements. Our clients need more help in certain areas now. So how do we have, you know, agile redeployment of teams, right? From one practice to another, where there's a skill that and they can easily be redeployed. So I think we are also pushing ourselves to see how do we have agile trading models in this situation. There are always calls around Compensation and benefits, which I think all organizations have to do, we spoke about it. Uh, and I think one thing that becomes important again, it's a, you know, it's a value of who you are as an organization, is that how do leaders do some of the actions, take the pain, right, to start with, and then really think of how do you support the right thing for staff. So sometimes you need to say that I will postpone the decision. I want to do there's better visibility, something that's important to preserve at a point in time and make sure that you keep the teams together, you do the right things for the organization. So that's another piece which is there. And I think two last points I'd like to make, Tetali, is uh, again in the spirit of looking ahead. One is a huge time for upskilling, right? We've already spoken about it, but I think client facing organizations like ours, we tend to have so much focus on being out there in some client, we're really trying to use this time for upskilling, whether it is digital upskilling, which we're committed to, whether it's about skills in certain technical areas, whether it's about skilling in areas like market making, commerciality, we really are using this time for a lot of upskilling. And that's something which I think appreciate as well. Uh, and talent is even more important. So focusing on talent, uh, helping to see how do we protect, nurture, ring fence, even more important like this. So I think keeping that balance, how do we help to get through what we're doing now with the right balance of care, empathy, and ensuring that we're also keeping our eye on the future and not in any way compromising what the future should be. I think it's really that balance which to my for Super, Back Padma just spoke. Thank you, thank you. So I think lots of very good practices we heard and, uh, you know, obviously almost all organizations that I have been speaking with are speaking on similar lines. I would, so this was what PwC is doing and what PwC is thinking. And I'll, I'll speak about the roadmap that we have, but I want to quickly go on to our external panelists. And on our external panelists, uh, you know, Ira, first one to you. Uh, very quickly, when you are viewing uh, Microsoft and its practices, how is Microsoft looking at the world of uh, for people right now and over the next three, six, twelve months? Um, I think um, at this point in time, similar to actually a lot that uh, both Chris and Padmaja said, we are an organization that has fortunately been uh, used to working uh, virtually and has right. been used to leveraging technology. And so where roles permit, team members often chose themselves to 
work from home for periods of time earlier as well. But I think what we are seeing is there's a significant shift in having the option to work from home and it being a compulsion. You know, uh, the physical as well as the mental state of mind shifts, I think, a little bit. Um, and a couple of things we are seeing is the whole concept of sharing space with the family. Uh, you know, both physical and mental again, sharing broadband, you know, sharing a desk. Uh, you know, uh, those are things which create uh, 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 tension and pressure and stress, um, which one would not automatically have thought would happen when one had the choice to work from home. And uh, for those reasons and many others, uh, again, similar to what we deeply, deeply want to invest in at this time for our employees and also our employees' families. And so we are seeing a lot of things that it's absolutely fine to have family in the background. If you're on a call and your dog is barking, that's absolutely fine. You know, I have team members on my call on my calls who are talking to me and saying, Ida, that's my buttons that I'm washing in the background. And that's absolutely acceptable, right? That just is the is is what we have to be able to do and to laugh about, truly, you know, to laugh about out and find joy in. Um, so we're also talking a lot about the fact that it's okay for employees to self-manage uh, because uh, take the breaks you need, just make sure that your manager is in the loop and you know, so self-manage, we trust you. And so then that brings you to the next thing, which is the role of the manager, I guess, right? And the fact that never has it been more important to be comfortable with being a remote manager. Um, earlier, the concept of a remote manager is you are here and your team is in Ireland or the UK or Sweden, but now the concept of remote manager is everyone is a remote manager. And so we're spending a lot of time investing in um, virtual capability building on what it means to be a remote manager, how it means to work as a remote team. Um, we're spending a lot of time reinforcing the fact that the fundamentals, autonomy, uh, mastery, purpose, those fundamentals haven't changed. Um, we still expect our managers to be role models, to demonstrate care and empathy at this time. Um, and we've, we've got to sort of figure out a way to help people understand that this is not a sprint. You know, uh, to the point that Dr. Aurora made at the beginning, we don't know how long this is going to go on, but it's certainly a marathon. And therefore, uh, just a lot of investment in the employees and caring for employees in every way possible at this time, giving them the physical assets that they need, uh, you know, giving them the uh, leave that they might need. We have something called caregiver leave. So, you know, allowing, allowing for that to be used, a whole bunch of things. But I think the focus is on mental health, on resilience, on engagement, on empathy, uh, but I think on two important things as well. One is inclusion, uh, because at this point in time, it's very possible that fear takes over and anxiety takes over, you know? And what ends up happening is that you'd end up being non-inclusive to neighbors or friends or, or family members or communities, um, which have been affected in very direct ways by COVID-19. And I think at least at Microsoft, what we are doing is continually pulling our company back and our employees back to the fact that we want always to choose to be inclusive. And this is the time when we cannot let fear and anxiety take over. And, you know, we have to bring people in and make people feel cared for rather than pointing fingers and sharing and, you know, assigning blame and so on and so forth. And so we're clear, very clear about what we expect from our employees by way of deep empathy and deep inclusion. So it's not only taking care of yourself, it's taking care of folks who are affected very directly. Uh, by what is happening around us right now. Outstanding. I wouldn't have expected anything different from Microsoft era, inclusivity at the heart of what we are doing. Uh, I, I think a, a very important piece that comes to my mind when I think of this is, so we've heard HR, right? And HR and business are trying very hard to change the way business is getting done. But Pramina, very quickly coming to you, and I know this is uh, uh, going to be a different one, but how do you see operating model in mm. your business change? And I, I want to keep it very quick because I want to you know, take to the other person and, and just draw these parallels, but how are you seeing operating model changing in your case, for instance, in your business? So I don't think operating models um, you know, have really changed uh, per se. We are uh, 
doing what we used to do, except that we are doing it, uh, you know, uh, from a work from home mm -hmm. model. So I think we spoke about all of that. The first part was really about getting uh, operational. Uh, but I would say the engagement model, and I think, yeah. you know, Ira and, uh, you know, a number of uh, Padma Jai, et cetera, spoke about it. The engagement model has certainly changed. I mean, we were not an organization that is very work from home oriented, you know, remote working. Um, <clears throat> it, it, there used to be a huge comfort in, uh, you know, face to face conversations. But I clearly see that the change to, uh, you know, staying connected remote has happened, uh, you know, very quickly. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, we are also urging people more and more that, uh, you know, let's do calls on video, uh, you know, because it, it kind of creates a, a connection and you, you have a smile and you have a laugh and, you know, somehow that creates that connection that otherwise, you know, you don't feel as much uh, when you're just on an audio connection. Um, and then you realize that there are other challenges about, you know, people who are maybe are not so comfortable, you know, smaller homes, uh, you know, uh, do, you, do you really want to put on your video all the time? You know, uh, family walking around in the background, we spoke about some of that. I specifically, uh, we realized that it's, um, um, you know, empathy is, a, is going to be a very important part of this to say that this is all okay. Uh, we realized that staying very productive is important here, not demanding productive, but staying productive. I think ultimately as, as, as uh, you know, highly effective human beings, uh, what makes us feel good at the end of the day is to feel fulfilled, to feel that we've achieved something. So I think if we take that away and make this only about feel good and, and, and wellness and some of the softer stuff, people might actually start getting more disturbed than otherwise. So Absolutely. without being demanding, you know, ensure that people have work on their on on their on, on their table, and you know they are doing the work, they are enabled to do the work. Uh, you know, there's enough of reward and recognition. So just sort of keeping everything happening, you know, like it were uh, a daily model, except that you're now operating remote. I think it's really the the bottom line that we realize. Super, Pravina, and I think the way I'm looking at it, the facade can't change. The facade has to remain the same, but everything behind the facade is actually going through a massive, massive phase. And the, the capabilities required to change the back end of the facade will actually have to team up. And I'm seeing some outstanding questions coming up. So I'll come to you, Sanjay, very quickly. Sanjay, your employees have the highest amount of exposure to the pandemic because they are actually going and testing those. Do you see the way you all will operate going forward change because of the lack of empathy that some may be experiencing, lack of inclusivity that some may be experiencing. Are you forcing greater use of drones? <laughs> no, great question, uh, Chaitali. Um, uh, so the way I would like to define this is, you know, that uh, we are in a state of war at this point of time. Only thing is, uh, the enemy is not a physical enemy. It's a bacterial or a viral, biological enemy. And uh, in this war, uh, the healthcare worker has to be at the front line. Um, and work from home as a concept really does not apply to us. Um, you know, some of our corporate functions, yes, they can do that. But, uh, you know, our feet on street, uh, people who are actually going to do the test, people are going to people's houses, uh, they can't work from home. So work from home as a concept, who I would say, 90% of our organization does not apply. Uh, what we have done is, uh, you know, I always believe that if I have to look after somebody else, I have to first look after myself. So that's the first thing that we have done is we made sure we look after our people. Uh, so what we have created is a team, what we call as COVID warriors. Now, these are the people who are the front line, you know, uh, in like the infantry of an army who are right at the battlefield. Uh, a lot of motivation, a lot of training, uh, and making sure, you know, that, uh, you know, they have enough protection, uh, getting their full, you know, the PPEs, uh, giving them, uh, you know, uh, prophylactic medication that can help them. Uh, but most important that they feel is, is we've, we've done something called as a Kudo board, um, you know, and we, you know, appreciate the team, uh, incessantly you know that's a, the one thing that has happened out of this for us is that there's so much of appreciation both in, internally and externally and nothing works better than appreciation because these guys are the ones who are actually risking their lives right at the front line 
and that's what we have seen that you know how do we make sure that they remain motivated they remain protected uh, giving them transport support and many times you know people like me have to be on the front line with them just to you know work shoulder to shoulder with them so you know some corporate functions yes we have uh, been able to you know try and adopt this learn this concept of work from home i don't think i have been home uh, for this long ever in my life i have been running this organization for 26 years and i can't remember ever sitting at home for so long you know so it's been a huge uh, you know change for us uh, from a outside in perspective you know we've had two very different uh, views from the public on one side i think uh, there's a huge amount of appreciation a huge amount of you know um, good wishes that flow in uh, for the kind of work that we are doing because we are one of those few organizations that has been chosen to do that but on the other side we also find that you know it's like you know someone who does not have a child will find a child cute as long as they don't have to bring the child up so it's okay to look at it at a at a distance but when you have to embrace it yourself people are very very fearful and i understand that fear you know it's there is so much of fear that has been created and i can understand for the right reason so we are trying to balance that you know that we want to make sure that people don't ostracize the healthcare workers people don't shun a person who's been you know detected positive there are ways to work around that uh, you know if you shun the healthcare worker where will you go in time of need um, so you know our prime minister had that initiative of clapping at 5 pm and you know that was inspired by i think what people are doing in spain and italy uh, doctors generally you know face a lot of criticism uh, you know so i'm glad that you know the slap is turning to a clap uh, you know which is a good thing for us um, we've also encouraged our customers that you know try and re- reduce uh, anything which is not urgent uh, not immediate so that we are able to you know reduce uh, the staff so we work now instead of three shifts we work one shift on alternate days so we are able to at least help people with that whole concept of social distancing so it's very important that how we protect our people inside uh, so that they can protect people like all of you sitting at home uh, you know you can be at home uh, it's because we are there on the street so we can help people be at home you know so that's important for us to look after our people first Superb, uh, uh, Dr. Sanjay, and I must say thank you. Uh, we we all owe it to the doctor fraternity more than we have ever uh, owed it to anyone. I think we've got some outstanding perspectives on what's happening uh, with organizations, with businesses uh, currently. Uh, what I thought I will try and do is uh, uh, very quickly and tightly bring it to the next conversation, which is: Is there a possibility of creating a roadmap for the future? it's it's a bit difficult let me put it that way yet what we have tried to do is uh, like i mentioned there is a lot of conversation that we are doing and we got perspectives from consulting we got perspectives from healthcare we got perspectives from technology there are a few important industries fmcg uh, there are industries uh, of pharma there are industries of manufacturing with whom we are having conversations day in day out we all need essential goods but those essential goods need to be manufactured somewhere how do you actually make that happen with social distancing with supply chain broken down with people so scared of turning up to workplaces that uh, they are not coming for manufacturing so some of the pieces that i wanted to also cover beyond what we heard from our panelists as, as follows as we are speaking with organizations we are saying there are two horizons to three horizons in which organizations need to work on and chris spoke about that keep them parallel there is an immediate two weeks to two months that we need to do and then there is the mid term and then there is the long term there are going to be pieces around employee health and wellness remote working urgently reviewing hr policies continuous communication and connect if we don't fix them now it will be a huge challenge for us to be able to function yet aspects around cost and aspects around virtual capability transition and business continuity planning are going to be very very important i'll give you an example there are many organizations who are coming and saying my workmen won't come my products are an essential segment so you know we thought of getting a few examples for you all and 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 through those examples maybe we'll uh, try and 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 talk to you all about what is it that we are seeing so there are some obvious examples around the immediate horizon right 
where we have helped a few organizations manage immediate connectivity, contingency. Uh, sort of very interestingly, what happens when your entire A team gets picked up and gets quarantined? And you have business as usual to actually do. What do you do of that one? That doesn't work out. Have you planned a red team and a blue team to ensure business as usual happens? So that's what organizations are doing on the immediate term. A big one that we are actually talking about are actually mid to long term. And mid term is not very far, by the way. How do you get organizations to think of workforce productivity over the next six to 12 months? And I saw a few questions that were coming over here, which was, why is it that we inevitably think of pay cuts? Because we are in the business of business. When working capital is getting stuck, you actually need working capital to keep the system going. And it's a locked supply chain, and it's a locked cash chain. And hence, organizations are ensuring that they can make that happen. Let's look at it this way. We want to be taken care of. Organizations also want to be taken care of. And I think that's the big one that we are working with organizations on mid-management transitions, on workforce productivity. I think the whole piece around managing people and productivity around disruption is a big one. The last one that I want to call out before I call in Kuldi for a bit is the whole aspect around transition. Organizations will have to take the inevitable decision of managing their people. When they actually take those decisions of transitioning people, there is a need to manage it. And organizations world over are doing various models. Somebody asked, what are the various other models, operating models? Some of the operating models organizations are choosing is to make it four days a week. Make few people give the option to go on partial work time. Give employees, because you know at this point in time, I don't have the requirement. But I think the most important one that organizations are trying to do right now is not everything is essential, yet the supply chain of essential is broken. Can other industries come in together, club together, and solve that problem? And I think the interesting one that has happened is we have almost always taken movement of people for granted. I, I need workforce down at the bottom of the pyramid. I need super specialists right at the top. People are not coming, so how can technology take care of that is one big piece organizations are doing. I think the only last one that I want to call out before I go back to my panelists is a lot of people are asking, how do you get organizations, what should organizations focus right now on? Bottom line, top line, what? I think the answer is very simple. If we survive this heat, bottom line and top line will actually be with us, number one. Number two, what do we do with workforces at the bottom of the pyramid? We have always felt the importance of super specialists. I think if you speak to the manufacturing sector, we will appreciate how today my workers have actually become my super specialists and my huge dependence on them. And hence how I actually manage them and how I actually take care of those uh, people who are actually working day in, day out for us will actually become very important. And third and finally, the other question that is coming from everyone, why this entire conversation around pay cuts, if at all, what should organizations be doing? Again, I think a very simple response to that. Every organization, depending upon its sector, depending upon its cash, depending upon its priorities, and depending upon the choices it's make, going to make, will have different decisions that it will take. And we are seeing that day in, day out with different organizations. Yet, I think preserving at this point in time for a better one is what most organizations are thinking. So, you know, Outstanding conversations, we are going to, you know, roll to all the people and going to, uh, you know, get all these questions answered to you. But I want to, uh, you know, have the last round of conversation with my panelists. And it's almost like a rapid fire. Uh, and this is the time when I want all my participants who have joined to please choose one of these three questions as the panelists also choose one of these three questions. If you could choose the question that you want to answer, Write the question number in the chat box and write your response. And I take about 10 seconds of break for my, uh, you know, uh, panelists to start responding. And I'm going to keep this real fast for my panelists. So a 10 second break for all of us to respond to this one and hear what our uh, call to action from our panelists is.
and I want all pa participants to also choose the question and respond. Good going, Vasan. Thank you so much. Ira, I start with you very quickly. What's your choice of the question and what's your action? For me, it's my biggest learning. And my biggest learning, I think, at this point is it's not only about what we choose to do, it's also who we choose to be at this moment. And we should really choose to be kind. Super. Ravina, what's your choice of question and, and what's your answer? Yep. So um, I clearly believe that, uh, you know, we need to be prepared uh, for consequences beyond where we are now. Um, it's possible somebody mentioned this can go on for, you know, 12 to 15 months. Um, are we really ready? You know, um, we are also happy with, with work from home and uh, video conferencing and whatever. But, you know, what if uh, telecom lines go down? Do we have, you know, further contingencies to that? So. Um, I think we have to think of uh, events of low probability, but uh, plausibility. And as long as they are uh, plausible, as we've seen, uh, I think we have to keep planning for uh, various scenarios and uh, have action plans in place that organizations can execute at short notice. Super, super. Sanjay, what's your question and what's your response? Uh, so, Chaitali, um, uh, you know, uh, three points to learnings, I guess. Uh, the first is uh, relationships matter in tough situations. No matter what, it's what it's the relationship that will get through. And I have an example where, you know, we always criticize the BMC, and here we have the BMC. We spoke to them last night that one of our consignment of testing kits is stuck in Doha. So the municipal commissioner spoke to the aviation industry, and the flight landed at 2 a.m. and we have the kits, and we are able to do testing today. Uh, Nothing works like relationships, no matter what the situation and the tougher the situation, the relationships matter the most. So make sure that you don't burn bridges, you keep relationships. A uh, second is uh, collective wisdom. I think uh, no one is as smart as all of us as we are learning, you know, on, on sessions like this, that, you know, uh, you know, be inclusive, keep taking feedback, because if you think you know everything, uh, you're in for a, you know, uh, a slap. So uh, no one is as smart as all of us. So, you know, collective wisdom is another learning. And last, I think we've spoken a lot about technology and I cannot uh, reiterate that, but I have a little bit of a comment on technology being a double edged sword. You know, technology is great to have. Uh, it's a great enabler, uh, but there's so much of dependence that can happen. And uh, as the previous speaker just spoke, what if, you know, suddenly there is a lack of technology or if there is a change in technology, you know, we get so dependent on a particular type of technology. You know, if we are using a Mac and to shift to a, you know, a different you know, laptop itself takes so much of time. So while technology is a great enabler, I mean, use it judiciously. Don't let it become, you know, that you become completely dependent on that. I agree, Sanjay. agree. Padmaja, what's your question and what's your answer? I guess... Uh... Maybe I'm just reflecting on what's the most important actionable, right? And as I think about that, I think what I say is, is the whole, you know, preserve yet build, right? I think it's very clear that uh, Sanjay spoke about you know, not 15 days, it's about 15 months. And we really are in long haul and uh, we have to preserve, right? We have to preserve fabric of we are our resources, we have to preserve our organizations as custodians. At the same time, how do we keep looking at building? I think that's the difficult balance. And to me, that's an important action. Mm. Preserve yet build. Paradoxes of life, right? Uh, Chris, what's your view? What's your question and your response? What? So my, my question is, what's the biggest learning? The biggest learning for me is, We've been trying to get not just PwC, but lots of other organizations to work in a more flexible and agile way for such a long time. And in such a short space of time, we've proved that it's possible. And that for me is much more than just technology. Technology is an enabler of it, but it's about behavior, which leads me on to my second point, which is if I could bottle one thing from all of this, it's the ability for all of us as leaders to be authentic. I think in many ways over the last few years, we've got so wrapped up 
in corporate terminology when all of our employees are seeing us face to face over technology talking from our home offices where they can see the environments in which we live i think it makes us more real as leaders and i think it makes us better as leaders as well very well said chris dr rana what's your question and your thought rana are you there All right. So I'm going to take one question, which is what's the one point of vulnerability? And I'm going to change it a bit from my organization uh, and make it in the sector or the industry as uh, consulting, which could hinder future success. And I think, according to me, as an industry, our ability to go deeper into the way we are working with our clients in these trying times is actually going to define what our shape and their shape would be. So our ability to do that, and I think the only point of vulnerability would be many a times our ability to think through their shoes is always there. How do we increase it multifold? It's going to be that point of vulnerability that we all will need to be cognizant of. I know we are up on time. I think we have had a fantastic, fantastic conversation. I personally have enjoyed every bit of it. Thank you so much, all my outstanding panelists. I, I hopefully have a better view of uh, uh, the pandemic and its impact. And hopefully we will be able to uh, drive a lot of important points for all our participants. I think in closing, there is only this much I want to say. Uh, there are big shifts that come to us and we have challenges. We learn how to manage some of those challenges. We often forget what that challenge was, uh, but it teaches us a few things. If there is one thing this is teaching us, it is number one, that we will have to be absolutely agile to every problem that comes our way. There is no answer that all of us have, but collectively we'll be able to solve the problem. I'm seeing industries coming together. I'm seeing organizations looking at novel ways to solve problems. And I think that's what this storm is all about. If the human being chooses to be the superior one, it will be able to only if it chooses to. And on that note, I want to say a very big thank you to all my participants and all my panelists. A big, big, big thank you. I know there are lots of questions. We are going to do, do two things. We are going to respond to all the questions that came our way. And uh, we will write to you all. We have your email ID. And uh, if you have any questions further, write to us. If we don't have the answers, we'll try and get you the answers because it is the new world and the new normal. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great weekend and stay safe. Bye bye. Thank you, Chetali. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.